Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'm going to talk about Conversations with God. This is a book written by Neil Donald Walsh. So Walsh was experiencing a low point in his life when he decided to write a letter to God, venting his frustrations. What he did not expect was a response. As he finished writing his letter, he was moved to continue writing and out of these came these inspired answers to his questions. First question was, how does God talk and to whom? This is the answer that he received. I talk to everyone all the time. The question is not to whom do I talk, but who listens. God added that I... My most common form of communication is through feelings. Feeling is the language of the soul. If you want to know what's true for you about something, look to how you are feeling about it. Feelings are sometimes difficult to discover and often even more difficult to acknowledge. Yet hidden in your deepest feelings is your highest truth. The trick is to get to these feelings. So first, God communicates through feelings. I also communicate with thought. Thought and feelings are not the same, although they can occur at the same time. In addition to feelings and thoughts, I also use the vehicle of experience as a grand communicator. And finally, when feelings and thoughts and experience all fail, I use words. Words are really the least effective communicator. They are most open to misinterpretation and most often misunderstood. Now the supreme irony here is that you have all placed so much importance on the word of God and so little on the experience. In fact, you place so little value on experience that when what you experience of God differs from what you have heard of God, you automatically discard the experience and own the words when it should be just the other way around. Then there are the tools with which I communicate, yet they are not the methods for not all feelings, not all thoughts, not all experience, and not all words are from me. Many words have been uttered by others in my name. Many thoughts and many feelings have been sponsored by causes not of my direct creation. Many experiences result from these. The challenge is one of discernment. The difficulty is knowing the difference between messages from God and data from other sources. Discrimination is a simple matter with the application of a basic rule. Mine is always your highest thought, your clearest word, and your grandest feeling. Anything less is from another source. Now the task of differentiation becomes easy with the following guidelines. The highest thought is always that thought which contains joy. The clearest words are those words which contain truth. The grandest feeling is that feeling which you call love. The grandest feeling is that which you call love. Joy, truth, love, these three are interchangeable and one always leads to the other. It matters not in which order they are placed. Having with these guidelines determined which messages are mine and which have come from another source, the only question remaining is whether my, my messages will be heeded. Most of my messages are not since because they seem too good to be true. Others because they seem too difficult to follow. Many because they are simply understood. Most because they are not received. My most powerful messenger is experience. And even this you ignore, especially this you ignore. Your world would not be in its present condition were you to have simply listened to your experience. The result of your not listening to your experiences that you keep reliving it over and over again for my purpose will not be thwarted, nor my will be ignored. You will get the message sooner or later. However, the point to remember is, I will not force you to have will. I will never coerce you, for I have given you a free will, the power to do 
as you choose, and I will never take that away from you ever. And so I will continue sending you the same message over and over again throughout the millennia and to whatever corner of the universe you occupy. Well, you have experienced, no one can deny that in life one comes across certain situations where one is totally cornered and no solution to the problem is in sight. Under such adverse circumstances, one cries out to help for, to, cries out to God for help. When one is rescued and bailed out, most men tend to look at it as a lucky breakthrough. They forget that in their moment of extreme agony, they prayed to Allah for help, and it was through His help that they were saved. Such experiences, experiences in life must always be remembered and valued. Now, we come on to other questions which he asked. All right, before that, let me um, add a few things. Now, as regards to prayers, he says that some prayers are not accepted. Then God's response is, you will not have that for which you ask, nor can you have anything you want. This is because your very request is a statement of lack and you're saying you want a thing only what works to produce that precise experience wanting in your reality. The correct prayer, prayer is therefore never a prayer of supplication, but a prayer of gratitude. When you thank God in advance for that which you choose to experience in your reality, you in, a, in effect acknowledge that it is there, in effect thankfulness is thus the most powerful statement to God, an affirmation that even before you ask, I have answered. Therefore, never supplicate, appreciate, and be thankful. So this is the punchline, appreciate and be thankful. But what if, and now he asks a question, what, but what if I'm grateful to God in advance for something and it never shows up? that could lead to disillusionment and bitterness. And God answers, gratitude cannot be used as a tool with which to manipulate, with which to manipulate God. A device with which to fool the universe. You cannot lie to yourself. Your mind knows the truth of your thoughts. And if you are saying, thank you, God, for such and such, all the while being very clear that it isn't there in your present reality, you can't expect God to be less clear than you and so produce it for you. God knows what you know and what you know is what appears as your reality. Then he asks another question, but how then can I be truly grateful for something I know is not there? Faith is the answer. If you have but the faith of a mustard seed, you shall move mountains. You come to know it is there because I said it is there. Because I said that even before you ask, I shall have answered. Because I said, and I have said to you in every conceivable way, through every teacher you can name, that whatsoever you shall choose, choosing it in my name, so shall it be. Yet so many people... Now, now again, another question by Donald Walsh. Yet so many people said that their prayers have gone unanswered. And God replies, no. Prayer and a prayer is nothing more than a fervent statement of what is so goes unanswered. Every prayer, every thought, every statement, every feeling is creative. To the degree that it is fervently held as true, to that degree which it may be made manifest in your experience. When it is said that a prayer has not been answered, what is actually what in Actuality has happened is that the most fervently held thought, word or feeling has become operative. Yet what you must know, and here is the secret. Now, now look, you can look at the slide. The secret is, it is the thought behind the thought, what might be called the sponsoring thought, that is the controlling thought, which matters. It is, if therefore you beg and supplicate, there seems a much smaller chance that you will experience what you think you are choosing. Because the sponsoring thought behind every supplication is that you do not have now what you wish. 
that sponsoring thought becomes your reality. The only sponsoring thought which could override this thought is the thought held in faith that God will grant whatever is asked without fail. Some people have such faith, but very few. The process of prayer becomes much easier when rather than having to believe that God will always say yes to every request, one understands intuitively that the request itself is not necessary. Then the prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. It is not a request at all, but a statement of gratitude for what it so. The second grand, great illusion of man, great illusion of man, is that the outcome of life is in doubt. It is this doubt about ultimate outcome that has created your greatest enemy, which is fear. For if you doubt the outcome, then you must doubt the Creator, you must doubt God. And if you doubt God, you must live in fear and guilt all your life. And that is why in the Quran it is given, already will come on to that, that the friends of Allah have no fear nor grief. All right. Now, every thought and every human action is based either in love or fear. There is no other human motivation. And all other ideas are but derivatives of these two. They are simply different versions, different twists on the same theme. Think on this deeply and you will see that it is true. This is what I call, this is what I have called the sponsoring thought. It is either a thought of love or fear. This is the thought behind the thought. It is the first thought, it is the prime force, it is the raw energy that drives the engine of human experience. And in this context, uh, the chapter of Quran entitled Surah Maryam, verse 98 is given, Lo, those who believe and do good works, the beneficent will appoint for them love. That is, those who do good deeds, God will plant love for them in the hearts of many people. Then we also come to this Quranic verse, the friends of Allah have no fear nor grief. Every action taken by human beings is based in love or fear, not simply those dealing with relationships. Mm -hmm. All decisions, every single free choice you ever undertake arises out of one of the two possible thoughts there are, a thought of love or a thought of fear. Love is the energy which Fear is the energy which contracts, closes down, draws in, runs, hides, holds, harms. And love is the energy which expands, open up, opens up, sends out, stays, reveals, shares and heals. Every human thought, word or deed is based in one emotion or the other. You have no choice about this. Because there is nothing else from which to choose. That is, you either go in for love or you go in for fear. Now life is a journey with purpose. The journey of life has started. Now the important thing is, do you wish to walk this path consciously or unconsciously? The deepest secret in this journey is that life is not a process of discovery, but a process of creation. You're not discovering yourself, but creating yourself in you. Seek therefore not to find out who you are. Seek to determine who you want to be. The soul, your soul knows all there is to know all the time. There is nothing hidden to it, nothing unknown. Yet knowing is enough, not, not enough. The soul seeks to experience. You can know yourself to be generous, but unless you do something which displays generosity, you have nothing but a concept. You can know yourself to be kind, but unless you do some one a kindness, you have nothing but an idea about yourself. It is your soul's only desire to turn its greatest concept about itself into its greatest experience. Until concept becomes experience, all there is speculation. God knew that for love to exist and to know itself as pure love, its exact opposite has to exist as well. So God voluntarily created the great polarity, the absolute opposite of love, everything that love is not, what is now called fear. 
in the moment fear existed, love could exist as a thing that could be experienced. So this is about all for today. We will pick up the threads from where we have left them. So in the second part, I will continue with the um, appreciation and uh, critical examination of this book that is Conversations with God. Thank you very much. God bless you.